church, has He changed anybody in the house today? Anybody online? Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you to you alone. Be all the honor and all the glory. Father, as we continue to worship you through the reading and proclamation of your word, would you reveal truth to us? Holy Spirit, guide us into truth. Father, help us to see the difference between the lies of this world, the lies of the enemy, and the truth that comes from the word, the truth, who you are. Father, if we've strayed off the path, your path you have for us, we've begun to drift a little bit. Father, I pray that right here, right now, we'd come home. We've come home. And you would do such a great that would change us. Lord, and we thank you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. For your glory, we, we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your seats, and I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 28 as we continue this teaching series titled Jacob. We kicked it off last week with Genesis chapter 27, but Genesis chapter 28, what we're going to see today throughout this chapter is a simple but yet profound truth, if that even makes sense to you. And the reason I say that is because this is what we're going to press in on. Grace cannot be earned. Grace cannot be earned. And so look in your Bibles, if you need a printed copy of God's Word, we have them in the back. We'd love for you to take a printed copy and own it and read it, dig into it, study it, meditate on it. We have some Bibles in the back. If you'd rather follow along on the digital, that's the version Bible app, you can scan that seat back in front of you, scan the seat back in front of you, and you can follow along in the text right there. But, but I'd love for your eyes to be planted in the Word of God each and every Sunday. Verse 1, chapter 28 says this, so Isaac summoned Jacob. So Isaac summoned Jacob. Uh, now, Jacob is the third patriarch of the faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was uh, Jacob's grandfather. Isaac was his father. Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. They were twin boys, and their names uh, were Jacob and Esau. And so it's interesting as we begin chapter 28, uh, context is always king. My dad taught me from an early age, context wears a crown because context is king. So I want you to understand some context in case you're just joining us in this series or just joining us uh, halfway through or there about uh, the book of Genesis. I want you to understand where we're at and what's going on. Don't want to lose anybody. So it's interesting, the, the, the verbiage here. So Isaac summoned Jacob. I automatically ask the question, why? Why did Isaac summon Jacob? What just happened? And what we see in verse 46 of chapter 27, we see, so Rebekah said to Isaac. So Isaac and Rebekah are married. They had two boys, Jacob and Esau. So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hethite girls. If Jacob marries someone from around here, like these Hethite girls, what good is my life? And so uh, Rebecca has one of those, hey, we got to, husband, we got to talk. We got to talk, like the private talks, like the, the deep talks, like no other distraction talks. You, any husbands know what I'm talking about? You know those moments. Don't lie. You know those moments. We got a, we got a, we got a situation. And she's like, it's over, man. If I continue living like this, it is over. My life is over. Esau had chosen to marry these, these pagan women, these women that did not have the same belief system. And he wasn't just satisfied with one. He, he, he wanted all of them. And so, so he marries, and we're going to see later on in the text that he continues to marry these women. Jacob hasn't married yet, uh, praise God. Uh, and, and so Rebecca is tired of of all the controversy, all the other belief systems, all the drama. She's over it. And this is what she says. 
sick of my life, because of these women, we need to send Jacob out. And so this is what happens. So Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite girl. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your, your mother's brother. Now, this is the same thing that if you look back to chapter 24, chapter 24, Abraham is about to die. He, he knows he doesn't have much time left. And he is concerned that Isaac must marry the right woman, the right woman, a woman that holds the same belief system. And so Abraham in chapter 24 sends his servant to the same area that now they are sending Jacob, their son, to find a woman who would hold the same value system, same belief system. There's something about waiting on that perfect one. And all the singles in the house and all the singles online, there's something about waiting for the one. Something about waiting for the one. And so we see in the opening text of chapter 28, we see that Isaac, he, he, he calls for Jacob, right? He calls for Jacob. He says, hey, you can't marry anyone from around here. We're sending you away. We're blessing you out. Now, it's also, uh, we need to note that as God preordained Jacob to continue the family line, Isaac does all he can to protect future generations, God and his sovereignty, which that, that thought alone blows my mind. That he's in all things. He's before all things. He's ahead of all things, uh, the creator of all things. God and his sovereignty, who God is, the living God that we serve, has preordained Jacob to continue this family line. And to ensure that he protects the family line, he sends him away to find his wife. There's a whole nother message in that for, the, for, for all the men in, in the house, all the, all the, the, the husbands, the, the fathers in the house to lead your home well, to lead your home well. Uh, again, on the other side of it, single ladies, that's, that's why it's so important to wait, wait for the right godly man, that God would bring that godly man into your life that would be able to lead you in the ways of, of the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing when, when both, when both men and women wait on the one that God has for, for them. God is so much smarter than me and, and you. And if we'll trust him, if we'll trust him, trust him, it'll be a beautiful, beautiful life. Not necessarily easy, but it'll be beautiful if we'll trust him. And, and so Isaac does all he can do to protect these future generations. Look at verse three. May God Almighty bless you. This is the blessing that he's sending him out. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham. This is that blessing that's, con the, that, that's following the, the family line that's being passed down. Abraham had this covenant with God and they're passing it down to Isaac. Now Isaac's passing it down to, to Jacob so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and, and Esau. Though, though Jacob is not deserving of the blessing, we, we, we need to understand this. Again, context. This is the same Jacob that stole his older brother's uh, birthright. This is the, uh, this is the same Jacob that stole his older brother's blessing in chapter 27. Though Jacob is, is not deserving a blessing, the grace of God has been poured out in his, in his life. And, 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 and the same is true for you and I. We are not deserving of any of the blessings that are from God, but it's because of his grace that he's poured it out upon us. And again, grace cannot be earned. Grace cannot be, be earned. We see the blessing that, that Isaac gives Jacob. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of, of Abraham. Listen, God blesses us because of his goodness, not because of, of our goodness. God blesses us because of his goodness. It's nothing to do with you and I. 
God blesses us because of his grace, not because of his good works. He, he, he blesses us with his grace, not because of our good works. Now, after we've surrendered our lives over to Jesus, there's a new motivation inside to want to honor the Lord and to serve him and to become more and more like him, to grow in this faith, to live a life that brings him glory and honor. But it's all because of his grace. And it's all because of his goodness. Grace cannot be earned. Verse, verse five, Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram. We see that Isaac, he's sending, he's sending his son to a, another area where he will find the one that he will marry. But it's interesting, uh, and it must be noted up to this point, that Jacob is not a spiritual man. He's a work in progress. If you read through, if you've been with us the previous chapters, you see that Jacob is not a, a spiritual man. We've seen no evidence of, of his worship. We'll see it here in just a moment. But up to this point, he's not a spiritual man. He is a work in progress. And, and, and friends, that's good news. That's good news to all of us that we all are a work in progress. Years ago, we had shirts printed, no perfect people allowed. I don't know if some of you remember those shirts, but, but we plastered it everywhere we could. No perfect people allowed. And, and, and what were we trying to communicate? That you are welcome into this community of faith. Now, we believe that, 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 that a save people, uh, serve people, and that, that people that encounter the living God can't stay the same. We believe that, we preach that, we teach that, but we want to make sure that, that we understood that we're all equal at the foot of the cross because we've all sinned against God. We're all in desperate need of, of his grace poured out upon us. Verses six through nine, we see that Esau still wants his father's blessing. He still wants his father's blessing, but he is still doing evil in the sight of, of the Lord. Verse six, Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padanaram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite girl. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padanaram. Esau, verse eight, Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women. So, verse nine, so Esau went to Ishmael and married, in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Neboeth. And so what, what is this? What's happening here? Esau wants the father's blessing. He asked for it th three times in chapter 27. Do you got one more? I know you've already blessed Jacob, but do you got one more? Dad, you got one more in you for me. You got one blessing for me. And the answer was no, each time. No, I don't, I, I don't have another blessing for, for, for you. He wants the Father's blessing. However, he's still doing what is evil. And, and what I mean by that, we see God's perfect design for marriage. It's between one man and one woman. We trace that all the way back to Adam and Eve. We've already looked at that. God created male and female. He created uh, Adam and then he created Eve because he knew Adam could not be alone. That was the picture of a uh, perfect marriage. That was God's standard of biblical marriage. You know, one man and one woman to enter that covenant. Esau's not doing that. He wants to marry all of them. <laughs> Look at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. Jacob makes this 40-mile journey. How do we know 40 miles? Verse 19 tells us that he's in Luz, L-U-Z, which he will now call Bethel, which means the house of God, Beth house, El, God in Hebrew, Bethel. He makes his 40-mile journey. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, walking the mile, you know, <laughs> but, but this man makes a 40-mile journey, and he is dog-tired. He's laid out, and all, all he has is a rock to act as a pillow. Verse 12, and he dreamed. 
A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky and God's angels were going up and down. This is the dream. The Lord was standing there beside him saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. It's the dream. He's tired from the journey, goes to sleep, and he dreams. Now, everyone dreams. Everyone that I know of dreams. But, but not all dreams are from the Lord. I shared it. At the 9 a.m., that the most vivid dream that I have, I, we all kind of have maybe that vivid dream, you know, in our minds, some, well, somewhere here. And uh, and the most vivid dream I, of recent that I have is I was playing on an NBA team in the NBA finals, and I, I went up and I just crashed the boards, man, dunked on somebody. And then I woke up and I'm like, nah, I'm 5'8, I'm and NBA ain't ever gonna happen, you know what I'm saying? Not everybody goes pro. So, um, Everybody dreams, not all dreams are from the Lord. Some can be. God speaking in a dream does not necessarily make, uh, uh, mean the recipient is more spiritual. There's, there's, there's some people in, in some kind of a camp that will, will try and say, hey, unless you're dreaming, unless you're doing this, you're, you're, not, you're not really walking with God. We need to be careful. But this is the dream that Jacob has that night. There's a ladder. There's angels. They're ascending and they're descending. Angels coming between heaven and earth. And, and what does all this mean? One of the takeaways is that God is involved in the affairs of earth. God is absolutely involved. I mean, how can it be a sovereign God and not be involved with what's happening here around us, in your life and my life, certainly by his goodness and his grace, he's saved me time and time again. Over 2,000 years later, Jesus will refer to this dream in John chapter 1, verse 51. In John chapter 1, verse, verse 51, the scripture says, Then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and on the Son of Man. I want to pause that just for a moment. I want to back up to verse 43 of John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave from, for Galilee. Again, this is 2,000 years later from, from where we're at in Genesis, Genesis chapter 28. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip. And told him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. So what's happening here? Jesus is calling these fishers uh, a fish to come and be fishers of men. He, he sees Philip. He sees Nathaniel in the Galilee region, the northern region of Israel, the, around the Sea of Galilee. And what does he say to them? Follow me. Man, follow me. Follow. Follow me. And, and so Philip, he sees something different in Jesus. Don't miss this. He sees something different in, in Jesus. And so he goes to Nathaniel and he tells him, listen, this is the one that Moses wrote about. Moses' writings. The Old Testament points to Jesus. The first five books of the Old Testament are written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by Moses, penned by Moses. And, and, and the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. Uh, then the rest of the Old Testament, the prophets, all these prophecies, they're, they're pointing to Jesus. The Old Testament points to Jesus. And so Nathaniel, he, he asks Philip, and can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now Nazareth, for those that might not know, uh, Nazareth was, uh, well, it was a podunk kind of town. Not much happening there. 
they didn't, they didn't have any, they didn't have a stop sign. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was that, uh, it, it was that, that just small kind of town, uh, not much happening. And so Nathaniel asked this question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, the answer, Nathaniel, is yes, absolutely. That's where our Savior, that's where our Savior, and that's where the prophets of old prophesied that Jesus would come from, Nazareth. And I love Philip's answer to Nathaniel. And this is the same message that we have for a lost world. This is the same message that we have for our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and the, the random person in the grocery store and, 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 and whoever the Lord would place in our life. This is a simple message. Come and see. Come and, and see. We just sang a moment ago that Jesus changes everything. And, and can, can we really sing that? With, in, with the integrity, if we don't believe it, as our life reveal that Jesus has changed us. Verse 47, then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Verse 48, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. <laughs> I love the question. How do you know me? He, he, he doesn't know who he's talking to. Uh, Nathanael asked, Philip, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. When you were under that fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. And then verse 49, Rabbi Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things. Did you hear Jesus' response? You will see greater things. And what are the greater things that he's referring to? The greater things. Jesus knows what's to come. Jesus knows that he is sent uh, on a mission, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus knew the end. He knew that he would go to a Roman cross and he would be crucified on that cross and his blood would, would shed not just for one people group, but for all people groups. The gospel is for all people, and that Jesus, he wouldn't just stay dead hanging on that cross, but he would be placed in a borrowed tomb, and he wouldn't stay in that borrowed tomb, but, but for, on the third day, he would rise victorious from the, the grave. And he's alive today. 